What's up, geniuses? Welcome back to For The Record. I'm your host, Rob Markman, broadcasting live from my bedroom and urging you all to keep your asses at home. For one, because it's safer that way. And two, why would you leave your house when today's guest has provided us with all the best entertainment from his home? He's the host of the highly controversial, highly watched Quarantine Radio, and he just dropped his latest album, New Toronto 3, and he's here with us now, the newly independent... Tory Lanes, man. Welcome to For the Record, yeah, man. You, you, you. What's what good, brother? Showing like a villain, man. Just here, I'm at home. I'm rolling up. Um, album just dropped. Well, not, mixtape just dropped. Um, mixtape just dropped. Feel good. I feel blessed, man. Talking to my, my dogs. I ain't seen you in a while. Nah, I ain't seen you in a minute. Well, nah, I actually seen you because I'm tuned in to Quarantine Radio, dog. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> It's wild what you've been doing. Um, let's start there. Listen, I've been on a lot of Zoom calls, a lot of me like I feel like a lot of businesses, right? There's a lot of marketing meetings going on. There's a lot of people trying to figure out how to give like meaningful content. And it's something that you've done very organically. Yeah. Can you can you just talk about the birth of that idea? Um, honestly, I never made a quarantine radio to be quarantine radio, what it is today. Like first time I had did it, I was just uh, in my living room. All I wanted to do is just play some music and like, you know, have a couple sound clashes with like my friends and stuff. Like it was never supposed to be that. And then when I started it, I did a sound clash with my mans and then Bryson Tiller jumped in and then Bryson Tiller jumped in and then Justin Bieber jumped in right after him. And then it just started turning into this thing. And then from there it was just like, you know, people just liked it. He just liked it. My man's walked out the room. The dude who's like the ad lib man, he was he was in the guest room, and he just heard me like for like four or five hours, just wild and like you know having a good time. And so he comes out and he just hands me this mic. He handed me the mic and he's just like, yo, this niggas. He looked at the, the amount of people. It was like twenty thousand people. He's like, yo, this niggas, booming. I should help this nigga. So he starts doing my ad libs, and then it just turned into quarantine radio. Like that's literally how. Just you know, some girl jumped on there, started twerking. He did the ad libs. I was talking. People loved it. Just <laughs> turn it to quarantine radio. You beat Taylor Swift's record for the most IG live viewers. Um, you know, when Drake entered the live stream and y'all had that moment. Um, well, we beat that record too by ourselves though. Okay, before the Drake thing. No, after the Drake thing. When, after when, the Drake when thing. Drake came in, we was already at um, 190,000, 197,000 views. And then he came in and it went to 310. And then we cut. And then the last one we just did last time went up to 357. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. D- does this open up new possibilities for you? Because I've I known you and me knowing you. I always know you, you like a character, dog. Aside from being just very focused on your music, you'll do five songs a night. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But you're also a character. You're just like entertaining to be around. Does this open up new lanes for you? To, uh, is this sparking TV ideas for you or, or your own radio no, show? I mean, I was already... I was already going out for acting. I was already doing certain auditions and stuff like the big movies and self tapes and stuff like that. And um, for me, I think it allows just people on the outside to get um, a different outlook on me opposed to the, 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 the competitive, always like just about being the best type nigga. Like, you know what I'm saying? And people get to realize like, I'm not always like that, bro. I don't even give a fuck about that. Like, I just, I really like I, I appreciate my music and I and I believe in my music a lot to the point where I'm confident about it. But at the end of the day, like throughout my day, I'm just having fun, my nigga. Like I I, I be joking around at times I'm not supposed to be joking around at. Uh, like you know what I'm saying? I say shit I'm not supposed to say. I'm very honest. And I'm very blunt, which is another reason why sometimes people don't really like that about me. But I'm honest. I'm blunt, and I am me at all times. You feel me? So you know. That's a fact. That's a fact. Um, something else that's distinctly you is this new Toronto three. You, you called it a mixtape. I called it an album in my intro, but but it's actually a mixtape. Yeah, it is a mixtape. Nah, it's 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 literally on Apple Music. It's, it's called a mixtape. Mixtape. It's okay. you know what I'm saying. And and the reason why I just you know when it came down to um, my situation at the time, you know I had one more project with the with the label, and I was just like, I'm not going. Number one, I'm not going to promote this shit. Number two, it's not going to be a real album. Especially after the fact that we just came off the Chicks tape. But off the fact that we just came off the Chicks tape and that was connected to the New Torontos, let's give them a New Toronto 3. Let's call it quits. Yeah. Did, 
th- there's some confusion, or, or I think from the outside looking in, when we're not involved in these deals, that I, I think there's the feeling, and maybe we're wrong, that mixtapes count differently than albums contractually wise. But you were able to drop a, a mixtape and, and mix still tapes, fulfill your contract. All of, all of my mixtapes has always sounded like albums. You yeah. feel me? So it's always been one of those things where <coughs> when people have heard my music, they've always been like, wow, this whole tape is like, or they just call it an album or whatever because all, it's all original music. It's always been, um, you know, I'm not freestyling on a bunch of people's beats. So it's still like, it's just, I, when it's not like at the album level, like I worked on all the beats and all the production and I went super super crazy and we promoted and da 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 then it's like it's not an album to me it's like if i if i did it as a mixtape then i dropped it as a mixtape just like the rest of my mixtapes it just happens to now be on platforms right okay nah that's yeah, dope man know. but you know listen man mixtape album man the shit is fire shit Chick- doing great <sighs> coming off of chick state first of all chick state five fire the tour fire Appreciate like that, how you was able to bring out so many guests um and, and really bring those records to life um, New Toronto 3, you know, I, I love, you know, you Tory singing, Melody is all of that. Man, I love when you get to see a rap bag. I love when it's one Me long too. verse. I love when it's just feeling <laughs> so you, you must have been having a field day with this album then. It's, it's crazy, man. <laughs> Let it to my city too. Yeah. You just started off, like, as soon as you hear this verse, I'm out the record deal. Exceeded 12 albums, four years. That's a record still. Yeah, like even for that line, for that, that that line actually sums up the last question. It's like when I say twelve albums, it's because it was also mixtapes that were original music that we worked on at like albums. Like for instance, like you have Chicks Tape uh, Two, Chicks Tape Three, Chicks Tape Four, New Toronto One, New Toronto Two, International uh, Fargo, um, uh, Cruel Intentions. That's six off the top right there. You get what I'm saying? And then I mean our. That's that's six or seven off the top right there. I, I can't remember what I just counted, but basically, and then the other five albums that I actually did with the label. You get what I'm saying? All in a matter of four or five years. Four or five years. I, I remember because I always charts your career. When I first got to Genius, when I left MTV and came to Genius, is right around the time you was popping before that, but I think the Interscope thing, that, that's when Love blew up, which was for the mainstream audience, the arrival of Tory yeah. Lanez. Um, so I, I always count our runs, my run with Genius and your run with Interscope as like a, a same time mistake. Definitely, yeah. definitely. And, and, and I know you, you've, um, you've been in that building holding it down for so long. And so I know that even like anybody just working anywhere for that amount of time, you've seen it's been a long time. Like even though, you know, the, the, the years, you know, that they, they pass by quickly, it still is a long time when you're working um, from the bottom up. You know what I'm saying? So... It's been a it's been a while since the last like since the first interview that we had when I came into the uh the room. I don't even think the rooms was yellow yet or anything. Like nope. I think yeah, we was just, you know, we was just in a little room with like a little little hut and at the end of the day, bro, like look at it now. Everything is, is out of is out of place where it's, it's fluctuating and it's blossoming in a, in, a, in an incredible way. Well well, you know, now you got you got options, you got crazy options. Look, going back, because you know I'm a lyric guy, man. You know, let it in my city. The next move is going to be fully independent, and any label offer under 100 mil is just offensive. Um, fact, bro. <laughs> what What are you fact. looking for? What's the? You're a free agent now. I'm not looking for nothing. You're not looking for nothing. I don't want nothing. I'm I, like you got to look at it this way. Let me really break this down for you. Like if and if and if and I really want y'all to take this part and 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 put it out there so 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 labels can really get this into perspective. Number one. I already own all my masters. I own all my publishing. I don't have uh, a 360 deal with nobody. I'm not, I don't have no contractual obligations to anybody right now. So that's number one. I own my, my, my masters, I own my publishing. When it comes to videos, I do all my own videos. I do every edit on all the videos. We own the equipment. I have an in-house team that works. We have our own in-house producers. We have our own in-house art directors. We have our own in-house directors and editors. I edit all my videos. Every video that you've ever seen of mine, I was on Adobe sequencing the video. Boom, take that out. TV, we already have our own people. Everybody is in-house. As far as money, I'm already rich. I don't need nothing from none of y'all niggas, my nigga. I live in a great house. My son lives in a bigger house. Like, I don't, I don't, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, it's not nothing I really need. So it's like a label coming to me and telling me, 
oh, well, you know, we can do this and that for you. Like, yeah, you know, y'all might could help with some sort of distribution, but what I don't need nothing from y'all. I need nothing. I do my own, I, I, I do my own fucking everything. Videos, TV, radio. For the last five or four years, I've been doing that shit for myself. Everything that y'all have been seeing is like I've already been working independently. Only this time, I'm not working. And while I'm working, niggas is working against me because they can't believe that I'm working by myself. Mm. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, nah, that makes more sense to me now, right? Because you had, you had another line on there, right? This shit was bad love till I seen my advance. They took radio from me. I stayed proud of my stance. I didn't understand that line because at least me being in New York, right? Every time I turned on the radio, I heard I was Tory Lanez. in New York, but you know why? That's because every single time I dropped the record, I did 300 dub plates for the records, my nigga. Hmm. You know what a dub plate is? For those people who don't understand what a dub plate is, a Explain dub plate is not when you go on a song and say, hey, yo, DJ Camillo, da-da-da-da, you do a drop. Nah, a dub plate is, is when you say, talk to me, baby. You's a pretty little... You change, you literally ch go back into the session and change the word with the DJ's name. So let's say I was talking about DJ Camillo um, uh, or something like, for instance, when we did Freaky, I had to go and start... I had to re literally do 300 times, 300 different takes of different DJs and say... DJ Camillo got two holes, white skin and chocolate. And I had to do that for every single, exactly how it starts and sounds, the same plugins. 300 of those every time I dropped the record. You got to think about that. That's, that's work ethic. That's work ethic. And that's what kept me on the radio because no matter what, if, if the label didn't send my shit to, to, uh, to, 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 to full rotation, I was still, I still had... I still had my own mix show DJs because my name was in the, is, is, their name was in my songs. You know what I'm saying? So imagine hottest Tory Lane song that's out and you have a custom version with your DJ name in it. You're going to run that shit. And if you think about it, you know, the, the dub plate comes from Jamaican dancehall culture, that, that ideology. Yep. Um, but even in hip hop, when we talk about it, the DJ was always the most important figure. And somehow I think the business got away from that. But you as an artist recognize that. And if you serve the DJ, then the DJ is going to serve you at the same time. That's a fact. And that's a fact, because the whole thing is, is like, you want these DJs to run your record, but why? Who are you, my nigga? Did I grow up with this DJ nigga? Did this DJ nigga know me from somewhere? Did we jump through the trenches together? No, nigga. He, he either likes my song or he doesn't. And what if this nigga doesn't like my song? How can I get this nigga to fuck with my song? I gotta put his name in it. <laughs> I got to his name in it. You just gave out the cheat code, man. Now everybody... <laughs> nah, but here's the thing about the cheat code. It's not even a cheat code, because it's a thing that's been around. But here's the thing. It's like, none of you niggas are going to take 300 takes and sing your song in the exact voice, the exact everything, and do that 300 times with 300 different custom names. Sometimes the names don't even fit in the spot that you want them to fit. Right. Sometimes you got to... It's like... If you don't have that work ethic to sit there for 300 takes, and when I say 300 takes, that doesn't mean you're gonna get them right every time. So let's just say you get, let's just say it takes you two times to do every take. That's 600 takes. You fuck around and some nigga's name be mad long, and it's like, yo, I can't even, I did this nigga's take like nine times. So it's like, if you have the work ethic to do that, okay, do that. And that's, that's gonna get, that's gonna propel you. That's a, that's a gem you should know. You feel me? Like, Drop your dub plates. I do 300 of them every time I do a record. That's hard. That's hard. That's you know? a gem. That's a joke. Um, last thing, because I want to move on. There's a lot of shit on this album that is really dope. Um, Let Into My City, what was the science behind... There's some names that you bleeped out. There were some things you were very open and honest about, and then there were some names that you bleeped out personally. I know a lot of people have questions um, about who it was, but... More like why why leave that out because you're so blunt and honest. I'm in a I'm in a uh, I just ain't legally I just couldn't you know what I'm saying like legally it's gonna propose a problem and so I was just like I I got to get my truth out regardless you know what I'm saying but if I if I bleep out the names the nigga who I'm talking about knows I'm talking about him and I think I, and I think the fans who have followed you the people since who, the, the people know. know what's going on the people right. who really know what's going on know what's going on and for my core fans. They know what's going on. So it's like, at the end of the day, I, like, Letter to My City is very special because it was the outro to the first album. The first New Toronto 3, it was the outro, and I never gave it the just do I was supposed to give it on a New Toronto 1. 
So I was like, I'm going to really do what I was supposed to do on a new Toronto 3. And I'm bring it back for that purpose. Mm. You know? That's hard, man. Um, yeah, Dope Boy's Diary. Another one, man. You just one of my favorite up. records. You just open up, man, about, about the streets, uh, your life, before music. But really how, how, how you change, too, right? So, again, I'm just going to post some bars, right? We bought the Rolex. Crack bought the bus down. Trapping did the home run. Scamming did the touchdown. Think about my son now. No, I got to stay alive because I done let him down like four times and I can't make it five. That's a that's a that's a very serious line. Talk about mm-hmm. it. Um, like I don't like to to ever. It's kind of like a touchy subject because I don't ever like to portray to be any sort of way. You know what I'm saying? Because I I'm an artist at this point of my life, but at that point of my life, I was homeless, was fucked up. You understand what I'm saying? I was sleeping in the park. I was sleeping in the trap. I was sleeping wherever I could sleep. So the things that were around me and the things that I was influenced by was watching, you know, the 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 the, the, the continuous niggas with work coming through the, through, through the trap and and watching these niggas be be making money off the niggas that I'm. It's like, for instance, back at the times there was this, there was a spot and it was owned by this fiend named Ponytail, right? Pony tell you his spot was bunking. All, all the fiends was in there, like, you feel me? But that's where I used to sleep sometimes. So boom, until one time, one time Pony tell a uh, spot got raided and I never, I couldn't go to back again, whatever. But so boom, like, it was, a, it was a spot where everybody would go. And I would see multiple dudes go in there and just cash out. Just cash out, go in and, and leave. I'd never see them niggas in the trap ever after that again, ever. You know, it, 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 it would be, it'd be uh, weird shit like that. Like where it's like, not weird, but it's like, Niggas got their money. They not really from this side of town. They came, collected, picked up, and left. And me being like a broke-ass nigga on the couch, you know what I'm saying? Like, kind of watching all of that shit was what inspired me to like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta be this. This is what I should be. You know what I'm saying? Or I gotta do that. Or like, this is what I gotta do to get off this couch, my nigga. You know what I'm saying? Like, so for me, when I say like, um, we bought the Rolex, uh, it's, 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 and I'm not going to go too far into that, whatever the case is. I think it's self-explanatory. But when I say uh, we bought the Rolex, Crack bought the bus down, it's like Crack numbers and we numbers is totally different. Totally different. You selling niggas big pounds of weed. You sell, are you selling niggas big grams of weed? And gram of weed is like this big ass gram like this is like fucking uh, $30, nigga, right? A gram of, of thing like this is like a, like a, like a half ball. Uh, or a full ball, three fifty. You know what I'm saying? A uh, full, full Cuban is six, six, six bills out there. So you got to understand the money was totally different. So the you get and what I'm the, the prizes are different. That's how you prizes go from a are Rolex totally to, different. To, to a bus totally yeah, different. Totally different. And it. then, and when I say scamming brought a touchdown, I mean uh, to all my scammers, they know what I mean by touchdown. I just mean scamming brought the TDs. That's right. it. You know um, I mean? see, but the more important part of that whole thing for me, right? Because it, it, this goes into your mentality is. How did becoming a father change you? Like, I let my son down four times. I can't make it five. Like, what was going on? Like, at a certain point in your life that you look at your little man is like, I got to switch all this shit up. It's, it's, you know, I think it's a moment of, um, it's not when he was born. Like, oh, my son is born. So I, I think it's a matter of my son is now starting to comprehend. And when, when your son starts talking and starts, um, starts, you know, sounding like the people around him, you're like, yo, my influence needs to be there because now he's taken from other people. You know what I'm saying? And I think uh, for me, there's times when I wasn't able to be there because of work or, or whatever I was doing or work purposes or whatever. And it's like, I let him down four times. And it's like, nigga, I can't let him down again. Like, you feel me? That's my son at the end of the day. You feel me? That's what was the biggest was letdown? Like a, um, I think there was, like, there was, like, I missed his second birthday. Um, you know what I'm saying? Being on tour. I was on tour with Drake at the time. Um, but just certain things like that, I feel like, I feel like you know, there's, there's letdowns just as a father. Sometimes you're not always able to be there, you know, especially in my line of work at times when they, when they really need you. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like, you know, there's moments where it's like my absence probably plays a worse role and I, and I, and I want to make sure that I'm never, ever looked at like a deadbeat father because my father was always great. So I always make sure that I try to 
if, if I let you down four times, I ain't gonna make it five, nigga. That's all I'm saying. And and and, and that fifth time that I'm coming there, regardless, like I'm gonna make up, I'm gonna make it up for all the four times that I wasn't there. You know what right. I'm saying? So, yeah. Nah, that's dope, man. Because I, you know, I think the thing about you, and, and again, I, again, I think for the casual fans who may might just hear the singles and hear what they hear on the radio, you know, Tory Lanez, you talked about it before. There's a lot of people. The arrogance turned them off, or the cockiness, or, or just how you're blunt and you speak your mind. Yeah, and to then, be honest with you, bro, to be a thousand percent with you, the only the reason why I was really wilding like that at the time was because I just felt like in my situation of how I was signed and what was going on, they weren't treating me like priority in the building. Like, this may sound crazy, they really wasn't treating me like priority in the building. So for me, it made me feel like, why are all these other niggas priority, my nigga? I make better records than these niggas. I, 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 I can rap better than these niggas. And all these niggas that the world thinks is so ah ah, they just think that I'm a singer because y'all not allowing them to see all of my talents. So it's like, you know what? I'm gonna take this into my own hands. So the way I went about it was just, it was really a frustration and an aggression. But in all reality, it's like, I didn't really feel like that about niggas. I really, I really don't care if you're nice or if you're not. And I don't really care if you say I'm the best or not. It's just like, I felt like I had to do something in order for niggas to see like, yo, I'm really nice. Like put my, put my skills, Head to head with somebody, you know what I'm saying, and and you'll really see if I'm, you'll see, you know what I'm saying. What was there a moment in the deal at Interscope that that it just changed for you? Because obviously there's a lot of things there and in a lot of ways that you felt, but it was, was there just one thing that it was like the straw that broke the camel back? It wasn't Interscope. It was never like Interscope is not really like it's not really my issue. I was I was sub signed through another label, who, Copy. you know, the nigga in the label was wild connected to the top niggas in, in Interscope. So it's like when he turned his head, everybody turned their head. You get what I'm saying? Okay. But it, it, it's not, it wasn't like, it was just after love, bro. Like I, there's a real story and I feel like I'm, I'm gonna do a documentary or some sort of um, visuals about like what really happened and what was going on. Because, you know, I feel like the world should just know regardless, but not in a bad way. It was never like a situation where I felt like Interscope themselves is just the worst label, like, you feel me? Like, once I had got rid of the other guys out of my situation, everything was actually really smooth for Interscope. You get what I'm saying? So it wasn't, like, it really wasn't, it wasn't an all Interscope. I'm not going to try to put the blame all on Interscope. You feel me? Um, it just is what it is, bro. Like, you know, we, we, we came from a certain place. We did certain things, and, and it is what it is now. Like, Cop. Um, Dope Boy Diary, another thing, man. You, you, you found a way... It, Cause this tells me how recently you recorded this song, cause you got the Corona reference, man. Bitch, I'm o- I'm opening the fire, catch your bodies like Corona and the virus. Um, yeah, fucking um, I had wrote that shit. Um, I ain't wrote it. I freestyled that shit, but I had freestyled that shit like, um, um, like right right before the last week of like turning it in, which was like the week before we had put it out, which was the week before the release date. Like we did no promo for this at all. Like we just dropped, we dropped the album cover and the release date a week before, and just said, "Fuck it, let's do it." That that's dope when you can kind of put, where you almost as a fan connect the time. I I ain't gonna lie, I thought Fab was gonna be the first person to drop. You know, <laughs> Fab's everybody... always the first nigga with the punchline, <laughs> with the punchline of whatever's going on in, in pop culture. <laughs> He's the first one. You beat Fab, dog. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, message for God's children. It's the number yeah. one of those ones. I wanted to um to 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 make sure I touched on something, and I wanted it to make sure it was the last message on the project, just because of the fact that you know my dad is a missionary preacher. I've always been um I've always been in a place where I've watched him, and I was always inspired by the way he's um, been so ordained to speak. And for me, as a person, you know, I've 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 come from a place where I've watched, um, I've watched and seen things in my own life where it's like, I know, like for those people who don't know, my real name is Daystar Peterson. And what Daystar means is a progressive light of revolutionary um, change and, and progression to my generation. So basically like, basically saying I feel like I'm a light. I always felt like, like regardless, even if I'm in a secular world of music, my main plan is to always give people positivity, God-like energy, and, and to help bring the souls to the kingdom of God at the end of all of this, you feel me? And so, like, 
I wanted to make sure that my message starts being felt because from this point on, like the music gonna have more meaning, my nigga. It's not just gonna be, oh, I'm dripping and I'm ah, ah, ah. Like, nah, the music's gonna have more meaning because first of all, I have a lot of better music, number one, and I have a lot of more um, just incredible topics, things to talk about, things that really matter to me that I just never released because I was like in a scope in the other label that I'm signed to right now, they don't deserve to have this. Like, I, I deserve to put this out for myself when I get out the deal, so I'm gonna keep these to the sides. Like, like Rob, it's a whole acoustic album that's like, my nigga, if Ed Sheeran heard that shit, he'd take the whole album, bro. I promise you. It's like, it's like, it's songs on there, bro, that, I, like, I wrote this one record that was supposed, to, that I really wrote for Adele, and um, I ended up taking the record myself, and, <clears throat> The song's called Let's Get Married, and it's, it's a very timeless record, like, like timeless, like, you feel me, like, and, and, and it, it falls into a folder and a, a catalog of timeless music, and that's why I'm like, yo, whatever I come out with next and the stuff that I come out with, it gotta have purpose, it gotta have um, meaning to it. I don't want to be one of these artists, like, I've been here for 10 years, my nigga, like, regardless if nobody knows that or not, I started on World Star and getting my name out there and being like somebody in my city and da 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 10 years ago, bro. That was 2010. You get what I'm saying? 2009, if we talk about when the mixtape started. So it's like 10 years, I've been in here going at it. For the last six years, I was signed in a major label. I exceeded all five albums, I exceeded all the stuff, and it's like now I'm at a place where it's like, yo, there's nothing else I can do but release what I've been waiting to release, my nigga. That's crazy. That's crazy to hear you say that. And I love that you say that because, again, it goes kind of to my point earlier. Is like <clears throat> if you just listen to the Tory Lay singles, you're going to get the drip. You're going to get the fly talk. You're going to get the super cocky, arrogant attitude. But if you listen to the album, though, your albums and your mixtapes up until this point haven't been devoid of any meaning. You know, we yeah. were just talking about bars about your son. Like, we, like you, you open up your heart. There's, there's a humanity and humili a humility also to your shit. But to hear you say that there's a whole other level that you, that you about to go is crazy. Bro, like, I'm even telling you, I'm telling you, bro, I'm telling you, I'm a way better rapper now. Also, when it comes to the singing and like my topics, bro, it's about my topics, my nigga. Like, it's about the shit I'm talking about. It's it's, it's different. It's different, bro. I think honestly, first quarter, like if, if we still on this quarantine shit, my nigga, I think I might just release the acoustic album next month. I just don't care, fam. <laughs> Just don't care, fam, because I know there's certain things that I do, and once I do it, I'm going like this. It's like y'all niggas ain't seen me no more. I'm, I'm <laughs> ah, I left. <laughs> I gotta go, fam. You know what I'm saying? Like that's that's the shit that I'm that I'm talking about. You know? well, well, you seem to be focused on legacy because even it, it take me back because I had a question for you about Adidas. I promise when I die, they celebrate me like I'm pop, and and and. A lot of people have said that. A lot of people aspire to that Pac-like status. Like, I, I say a lot of people say it, and it'd be like empty words, because it's just a thing yo, to I, say. But it feels yo, like you're focused on that. I feel essential. like, honestly, and like, niggas going to be like, oh, you're bugging. But I feel like, you remember when Pac was like, I may not change the world, but I can spark, you know, the idea in the brain of the person who will? or a person who will do the same or follow the torch or whatever cases, I feel like that ass, like, like that, like that spark was me, my nigga. Like, I, I feel like, I feel like there's a lot of similarities between me and Pac. Not saying like, I'm Pac, I, I hate when niggas say that. I'm not ever trying, I'm me, my nigga. You know what I'm saying? But I do love Pac and I do feel like there were similarities in the fact that when you really think about it, I say whatever the fuck I want to say, my nigga, and niggas hate me for that or they love me for it. You know what I'm saying? I move how I want to move. I'll really punch your fucking face off in real life. It's, it's been proven. This is a proven fact. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm really just me, but I'm a happy guy. I'm not. I don't portray to be, I'm the most fucking gangster nigga. I'm never like that. I get love everywhere I go because I show love everywhere I go. You get what I'm saying? But I feel like when you really look at it, there's, 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 there's a certain level of bluntness and a certain level of I don't care, I'm going to say this, that we both share. That's all I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? I don't want niggas to get on get online and be like, right. oh nah, this nigga said he pop and ah like it wasn't. Right. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Nah, but I see, cause Pac was a was a dual, there was a duality to him. Like he he'll 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 say um keep your head up or he'll drop hit him up. 
And that's and it was fact. both equally as dope and different. It was just, one was inspiring, and the other one inspired war and and, and malice, that, and, and the and, other one inspired. And that's faith. what I be talking about. You know, I feel like I have, I can, I feel like I have a certain control in my music when people listen to it. And if I really want you to feel like I go out clap something right now, I feel like I can make that type of music if I wanted to. But I also feel like if I wanted you to go out and feel like yo. Life is worth it, my nigga. Like my life is worth it. I'm important. I'm a I'm a human being, and, and my my word matters too. I can make you feel like that too. I feel like there's both two ways, you know. I feel like on this album or this mixtape, this project is, is like real inspiring. First of all, I think these are the most Denny's bars that we got in a minute, man. I, Thank you. <laughs> it's like four or five Denny references, you know, broke in a minute, man. I was just working it's at real, Denny's, bro. came back, counted some millions. Um. And I think everybody can kind of relate to having that kind of job that you you have that that you know is not going to go nowhere for your future. But I, you know, I got to pay these bills, so I'll take this job. But you have Fact. big aspirations. Fact. Denny's was my last job. That's why I always reference it, reference it so much. And it was the job where they did me crazy, and I walked out of there and I had a moment. Like when I worked at Denny's, I was I was 16, and um, I had this manager named Steve, and and and. Um, Basically, my brother used to work there. My brother was the person who got me the job. Like, my brother was a top worker there. But one morning, we was both coming from the studio. My brother was mad tired. And I'm like, yo, I'm going to just take your shift. Because I, I guess I must have been still wired from the studio. But when I got there, like, six, like four hours in, I started getting wild tired. And I fell asleep. And this, this dude, uh, Steve, been waiting to fire me. Like, you feel me? Like, and I remember, like, I went there. Dude fired me. He fired me. And I remember putting all my stuff in the back, bro. And I walked out of Denny's, bro. And I remember telling them. I remember telling them, I said, bro, I promise y'all. And I, and I said this to them, and I said this after I left. I said it to myself. I said, I promise y'all, this is going to be the last time I ever work for another nigga again, bro. I'm not ever working for another nigga but myself. I'm going to make it pop with this music, and I'm going to work. I'm going to be my own boss. That's, that's just what it's going to be. And so when I left out of Denny's, it was like a moment for me because I never, ever took a job after that. I, I specifically tatted my neck. The, uh, this, this tat right here was the first tat that I got. And I, and I said, I'm tatting my neck so they don't even accept me there. So there's no, there's no opportunity, even if I say, nah, this didn't work. There's no opportunity. You got to go. It's like you have to win or you got to go out in a blaze of glory. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's how I kind of looked at it. So, so dope. And, and, and I love that the conversation is taking this turn because my next question is, is that a parallel? You at Denny saying, I'm never going to work for anybody again. You fulfilling your contract and saying, I'm independent. This is it. I kind of see a parallel there, like you as a worker kinda, and then you as like, an artist. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. like it's kind of like me saying to myself, "Y'all, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a work for myself and be my own boss." Me not understanding, I think at the time when you sign a record label, you feel like, "Yo, at the end of the day, I'm doing what I like to do, so I still am my own boss." But then there is other people that still control certain things. The difference between that and this and why I feel like I was living parallel through the whole time is because I made that decision while I was in the deal. When I was like, okay, I, I'm gonna be doing this by myself because there's no way this nigga at the top is gonna tell me that I'm not about to pop. And if I'd have took advice from whoever the nigga was at the top, I, or if I'd have did what the nigga at the top was making it feel like I had to do, then I'd have probably just fucking, I don't know, I'd have, I'd have been, if I'd have listened and been like, yeah, I'm gonna follow y'all lead, I, I would have been, I would have been shelved after love. After you heard everyone falls in love, you'd have been like, damn, that Tory Lanez kid was nice, but I don't know what the fuck happened to him. So I took matters into my own hands and said, fuck it, this is what I'm doing. Right. Well, now, now you're guiding careers as well, and you got artists signed. You, you, you name drop Melly, and you name drop uh, Cash Page on the album, too. You know what I'm saying? So so what, what, what do you teach to your artists now? Like, what, what, what are you setting your artists up? Well, I wouldn't for? call them my artists. I, I, even though, like, you know what I'm saying, I have to do a lot with they signing and stuff. Like I'm more so in the management space, and they also are my label mates. I don't like to look. I don't like that word when someone. That's my artist. Like, nah, it's like that's my label mate. That's my teammate. You feel me? Cash Page. That's my teammate. Uh, Melly. That's my teammate. You understand what I'm saying? Mariah Sanchez. That's my teammate. Davo. That's my teammate. You understand what I'm saying? Like, it's, these are not people that that I'm. I'm like, oh, I um, and they all have individual situations. Like Mariah the Scientist situation is different than Melly's situation when it comes to contractually. It's totally, it's different things. So I don't ever like to just call people my artist or like whatever the case is, even though, you know, I, if I uh, have anything to do with, you know, helping in any kind of way or signing or, or managing, it's like, 
we're still label mates, my nigga, because I still am an artist. And as far as Tory Lanez, the artist goes, I'm your label mate. You know what I'm saying? Um, so basically, um, I think right now, just for the people that I work with, I just tell them like, yo, it's consistency and quality. And, and no matter what, just, just, just be an entertainer, be fully you. You know what I'm saying? Because even if it doesn't click right then and there, it's going to click eventually. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can't tell you how many people in three years ago just hated me, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, but when people see other sides of you, like, for instance, quarantine radio, when it shows you, oh, this nigga just really just like to have fun, bro. And maybe he just had, he was just going through that at that time. It gives people a different perspective. So maybe it didn't hit at that moment, but it's going to hit. You feel me? Hey, what's up? Right. Nah, you can walk that. inside. You good? You ain't got to. Nah, man, you the bottle girl. You got to be good. <laughs> Um, lastly, man, um, yo, one, one of the dope things about this project, and again, cause I, I just want to illustrate the intent is, is when we go from a song like pain to Adidas, right? Cause, mm -hmm. cause just like listening to the sequence, like the first verse of pain just start off. I ain't go to school today. I got holes in my Adidas. Like, like really like sneakers or getting fresh or getting fly being the motivation of course. To, to, to get money. And sneakers was, sneakers was. Sneakers was, um, I think, the, the, the incubation thought of everything that I did that ended up bad. Like, you know, like all the shit that I did <laughs> that ended up like, yo, I should have really never did that. It was, I was most likely for, like, the love of, like, I'm going to be fresh, get some sneakers. I, I, the new J's just dropped. I got to get them or shit like that, you know? Right. Nah, man. And, and, and again, that, that's like a little subtle storyline within your whole discography. Like... Um, I know for the chinks tape, man, I appreciate, you know what I'm saying? You sent me um, a pair of shell toes, you know what I'm saying? So I got the, the, the chinks tape shell toes. Um, only 50 made, only 50 made. Yeah. Just want to say that, you know what I'm saying? Mine said one of 50. I'm just, yeah. you know what I'm saying? I, got the, <laughs> so I, I told everybody I got the first one. <laughs> I ain't going to lie. Mine says one of 52. We only two, <laughs> we the, <laughs> we the only two people with the one of 50s, you heard? <laughs> I just... I, I appreciate that. Um, is there anything else coming with Adidas, man? You said um, dope stash in my beam. I could cash out on Adidas, man. I yeah. Um, um, dope stash in my beam. I could cash out on Adidas. Should I rap? Should I trap and spend this cash on a feature? Or should I trap? Should I rap and spend this cash on a feature? I think that is a moment that a lot of people go through. And when I say trap, it doesn't necessarily mean you got to be selling drugs or anything like that. It's just whatever your your stitches that gets you money. You feel me? Like dope stash in my beam. I could cash out on Adidas. Um, you know. Like, like, should I rap or should I trap? I can, I can spend this on a re-up or I can spend this on a feature. And it's like sometimes when, 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 when your way is your, uh, your bread and butter, it's like that feature is like it either could be this or it might not. So it's very like it's risky. It's like, ah, you know, there's no way that I'm guaranteed to get my money back off of this. But hopefully it gets me to that place in the city where people know me and da 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 and this re-up is worth it. But then you still got to worry about how you're going to get your re-up. Right. So it's, 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 it, I think that a lot of people go through that. And um, whatever it is, like, should I, should I continue doing my job and putting my money into, you know, going to work every day? Or should I put it into this thing that I believe in? Right. You know? Yeah, right. What happened with you and French, man? What happened, dog? Me personally, bro, <laughs> if we want to be a $1,000... If we want to be a thousand dollars, I'm I'm always like I said, my vote goes to French because at the end of the day, I say like, yo, you know, I feel like you won. But if we just being political for a split second, a lot of those songs was not French songs, my nigga. These were songs that French was on as the remix or songs <laughs> he made his own remix to that ended up popping. But it's like the whole point of of the sound clash is when you go into the discography in the catalog and go do songs that. You are on. Like I was Listen. battling this nigga by myself. I wasn't bad. I didn't bring out any of my remixes. You know what I'm saying? I was battling. You ain't play controller. controller. You play controller though. You got I played controller. one because he played. Um, he played like he played. Uh, what was the one he played? Hot nigga or something. The Schmerder like, joint. Well, yeah. you know you wasn't on that original remix, my nigga. Like you know what I'm saying? But it was a big. It was a big thing. Just like I wasn't on the original controller remix, but my shit was a big thing. So like, it is what it is. But I still give my vote to French. At the end of the day, French is like. You know, somebody I've always looked up to. And what people don't realize is French is actually, when I was first getting on and doing hooks and stuff like that, it was only really two people that was really embracing um, the, the, the hooks like that. And it was, it was French and it was, it was Meek. And so, and that was when they was already into their careers. So, you know, already in the fact, knowing 
French, you already have like four, five, six years on me, my nigga. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, I know what you're about to do, but it was, it was fun because it's my man's, and I think we all had fun, and that was the point of it. Like, fuck, we on quarantine. Let's just do something for the people. Have fun. Nah, that, that was fun to watch, man, and, and thank you, man. I, you know, I, I think what you're really doing, you're right. There's, there's a lot bigger things in the world for us to be worried about and concerned with, but people also need escape. You know, from Thanks. the everyday reality. If you watch CNN all day, you're going to go crazy. Um, and I think what you're doing with Quarantine Radio provides that escape. Um, you know, even the wild moments. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm still trying to figure out why she showed up with the Mario costume. But <laughs> that's a whole Shorty, other that conversation. Was that was different. I ain't going to lie. <laughs> she, did, You know, the gummy worm, I, I, I still couldn't get past the Mario costume. I'm like, what is going on here? I can't even play Smash Brothers no more. It's a whole different meaning. <laughs> she, she came as Dory the Explorer the day before. I was like, wow, creativity is on a thousand. Nah, but but the um, the entertainment fact is real. And, and, you know, I think in all times of strife, it, just in our world history, especially U.S. history, like music gets us through. So definitely appreciate you dropping off this new Toronto 3. Definitely want to congratulate you on this independence. And I look forward to where it goes next. I'm going to hold you accountable for everything that you said. Those new levels that you said you're going to, I can't wait to see it. And every time I see you, I'm going to ask you about this acoustic album. I'm going to ask you about this, this, this nah, timeless most music. Likely, most likely, you know, it should be out before the next time we see each other, bro. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I can do whatever I want now. I don't gotta. I don't gotta wait on like nobody's release date because this nigga's coming out at this time, and like I don't have to. That's dope. I just do what I want to do now. You know what I'm saying? So it's it'll, it it's gonna be continuous music coming from me. It's not gonna be like my whole stature. Looking at it right now is it's just like yo, you never really know how long you're gonna be here. You don't know what's gonna happen. You don't know what could be going on. Like you know what I'm saying? And even like when the world stops like this, it kind of lets you know like a lot of the shit that we focus on it isn't really important. Like it's when you can't go outside and when you can't do this, that, and the third, it's like all that stuff is irrelevant. So for me, it's just like my thing is leaving a legacy and I'm gonna just leave as much music here as I can. You know what I'm saying? And, and I'm gonna always uh, make sure that it's quality. And so it's gonna be okay. And if it's like, you know, I'm gonna gain my own fan base off of that, off of the fact that it's continuous music for them to listen to and you know what I'm saying? And all the people who end up, you know, being fans of mine and, and being a part of our cult and a part of what we got going on over here, this one umbrella thing, like, they're going to be in for a long, good ride with, with quality music, you know? And, and we will build, regardless if the world thinks I'm oversaturating the market or not. Like, we going to build. So it's that's new, all that's important. There's new rules. The world is changing, man. And I, I, I look forward to the change. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that shit. For right. real, for real. All right, man. I'm going to let you get to it, man. I know you got a lot of quarantine things to plan. Um, <laughs> but we're going to get this out into the world, man. And hopefully this will be a companion piece to the album so people can understand the music a little better. I appreciate your time, brother. Much love, my dog. Be safe, you heard? All right, peace. And thank y'all for watching For The Record, man. Check us out. I don't know how long we're going to be in this bedroom, but as long as we're in this bedroom, we're going to bring y'all dope interviews, dope conversations. I'm Rob Markman. See you next time. Peace. Thank <laughs> you.